So welcome back everyone for the second part of this lecture. Um, I hope this is clear. So before the before the break, we uh, I quickly try to explain to you guys what hemis, hemizygous recessive is and why it is important when we talk about disease. Um, because a, a lot of, well not a lot of diseases, but some diseases are located on the X chromosome, meaning that as a male, um, if if you get the X chromosome which is broken from your mother and then you will always pass it along um, while if you are a female because you have two X chromosomes you might be lucky and only one of them is broken so then you have a 50% chance of passing it on to your offspring um, which is the which is really makes a difference in the inheritance pattern and, and when we start looking at inheritance diagrams later on um, we can we can see that it makes a real difference sometimes if it comes from males or females although that won't be this lecture that will be a later lecture okay so is there any questions about the first part of the lecture um, I did get a text um, saying that did we already do the assignments from last time and um, I will make some room at the end of the lecture for people who have questions about the assignments from lecture one um, because I looked at my github and I saw that only four people were able to make a fork of my repository and I think two out of four were actually successful in updating their version so um, it would be good that everyone at least tries to get the uh, the version control and the github thing working because it is an important part in bioinformatics to be able to do reproducible research um, because software changes um, so you need to be able to go back into time to redo an analysis as if it were 2019. all right so let's just continue so next slide here we see an example of um, an, an inheritance diagram, right? So here, this is from uh, Morgan. Um, it's a kind of restyled one because the original one was drawn by hand. Um, but here we see the experiment that we just showed, right? So the experiment that we just showed was we have females who have uh, white eyes and miniature wings. So they on one chromosome have a W and an M gene and on the other chromosome they also have a, a small w and a small m and of course we have wild type males so the males have a w plus allele because they are wild type so they have a normal uh, normal eyes and they have normal wings and of course we have this little bar underneath and this means that there's the there's the y chromosome so they are hemizygous so they only have one copy so that's the way that you would write it down in genetics right so then when they did this cross then they observed indeed that the, the, the individuals coming out were wild type females but all of the males had white eyes and miniature wings and that is of course because every male gets their X chromosome from the female so all of the males get a W and an M and they have a normal one while here the females they get a WM chromosome from the mother but they always get the W plus M plus chromosome from the father and since this is a dominant phenotype they will look like wild type Drosophilas. So what happens now when we start crossing these animals right so this is the F1 generation so if we take these wild type females who are not really wild type right because they have two different copies it's just that one of the phen or both phenotypes are dominant so when we cross these wild type females to the males that we get we get the f2 generation so in the f2 generation something interesting happens because now we see all of a sudden an explosion of variants right so we see that we have um, wide-eyed miniature wings individuals which are female we see that we have males again which have wide eyes and miniature wings um, we see that we have uh, wild type females wild type males we see that we have wide-eyed females who have normal wings and we see that we have um, males who look the same so they have white eyes normal wings and we see that there are the other situation where we have wild type eyes and miniature wings right so there is some breaking up going on and this is due to recombination right so now we can just start counting 
right? Because in this case, we can define if the animals look like the parents, right? Because these look like the father and these look like the mother. So we call them parental phenotypes. We also have animals which have one feature of one parent and a feature of the other parent, right? So they have recombined. So hey, we can define these as the recombinant phenotypes, right? So just looking at the animals, we just classify them based on their phenotype. So when we add up the numbers here, right, and these numbers are just an example, I think they are actually the real numbers from the original experiment, um, but what we observe is that in total we have 750 animals who have white eyes, miniature wings, we see 791 who are wild type, then we have individuals who have recombined, and we see other individuals which have recombined the other way. Right, so in total we observe that we have 1541 offspring of this cross, who has parental phenotypes, and there are 900 which have recombinant phenotypes. So now we can actually start calculating the distance between these two phenotypes, right, on the X chromosome. So how do we do that? Well, first off, we calculate how many offspring we had in total, and then we just say, well, 900 out of the total recombined, and then we multiply by 100, and then we see that we have 36.9 centimorgan between the W gene and the M gene. So both of these genes located on X, the distance between them is 36.9 centimorgan, right? Because we multiply by 100, so we have F centimorgan. It's actually 0 0.369 morgan. Um, but that's why we use centimorgan, because then we get into a percentage, right? So this is the way that we used to build genetic maps before we had any idea of the genome. So yeah, in the F2, the most frequent phenotypes for both sexes were the phenotypes of the parents in the original cross. So wide-eyed, miniature wings, red eyes, normal wings, right? So that's that's this group here, right? So these, these four types that can occur. Non-parental phenotypes, white eyes with normal wings or red eyes with miniature wings occurred in about 37% of the F2 flies. And this is well below the 50% which is predicted for independent assortment. Because if these things would be independent, right, if, they would, if the two genes would be located on different chromosomes, then we would have expected half of the individuals to be recombinant, right? Because the genes were not would not have been located on the same chromosome. But since they are linked, right, we see that 37% has the non-parental phenotypes, while 73%, uh, 63% has, uh, has the parental phenotypes, we can now say that indeed these two genes are located on the same chromosome and they have a distance of 36, 37 centimorgans between them, right? So how did Morgan, because Morgan just had this observation and now he needed to come up with something like how, how does this happen then, right? So what he proposed is that during meiosis or during when, when sperm and egg cells are created, alleles of some genes assort together because they are near each other on the same chromosome. So that's where his theory of chromosomes come in. He then proposed that there is something like recombination, right? So had parts of the X chromosome on the mother genome are exchanged with the other X chromosome in the mother. And this does not happen in the father, right? Because the father only has one X chromosome, it cannot exchange genetic material or it cannot recombine the two chromosomes together, right? So crossover occurs at the four chromatid stage of prophase one in meiosis. We know this now, of course, like men, uh, 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 Thomas Morgan Hunt had no idea about this. Um, and all chromatids may be involved in crossing over as chiasmas form along the aligned chromosome. So that is just how it works in real life, right? So if we, if we get to the fourth stage, and I think I have a picture of that. So let's forget about this last statement for now. Uh, but this is the invention that Thomas Hunt Morgan made. So how does this work? So just as a different representation. So if we have two traits, which are Mendelian, they can be very far apart on the chromosome. Right, so there is a low chance that both uh, that that both phenotypes will be passed on to the offspring. If we just talk about the X chromosome, right? So we call this they are weakly linked together. 
You can also have the situation, of course, where you have two Mendelian traits which are very close together on the chromosome. And then, of course, there's a high chance that both offspring will get, or that the offspring will get both phenotypes. Right? So that is the concept of linkage. And everything in genetics be is based on how strongly linked two things are. And of course, we're talking here about phenotypes, and that's because it's the phenotype lecture, but this also holds for genetic markers. If you can measure parts of the genome, either using SNPs or AFLP markers, then also two markers on the same chromosome will be linked together. And if these two markers are at the end of the chromosomes or very far apart, then their linkage will be low. If they are more or less very close to each other, then their linkage, so the correlation, will be high. Okay, so that's the one point cross. This was normally the break for the, or the, the, the slide at which I would break for, uh, for break. All right, so we call this a, a, a two point cross, right? Because we have two phenotypes, so we are looking at two points in the genome or two, two genes in the genome, and they, and, and this type of a two point cross can be used to, if, to determine if genes are linked, so if they are connected to each other on the same chromosome, or if they are independent, which means that one of the one of the genes is on one chromosome and the other genes is on the other one. But like we saw, we can also see that it can be used to estimate the distance um, between two genes. So had the the typical setup for what we showed right here, we showed the Morgan original experiment. And here, this is based on the fact that males actually only have one copy and females have two copies. But we can do a two-point cross as well for phenotypes which are on the autosomes. So it's not only sex-linked phenotypes, we can do the same thing for the autosomes. So what do we do then? Well, in a two-point cross, we take an individual which is heterozygous for phenotype A, we take an individual which is heterozygous for phenotype B and then cross it with an individual which is homozygous for A and homozygous for B. Right? So it has two, two small A's, two, big, two, big, uh, two small B's, while the other individual, so the mother has, is a, is a heterozygote, while the father is homozygote for both phenotypes. And then we set up the two-point cross, so we make, like before, so we mate them together, we get the F1 hybrids, right? So the F1 hybrids, they have a, a mixture of the two phenotypes. And then we cross these two hybrids with each other, generating the F2 population. And then we use the observed parental phenotypes, divide, or we use the, the observed amount of parental phenotypes versus the observed amount of recombinant phenotypes. So what do we calculate? We calculate then the amount of recombinants divided by the total amount, and that is the genetic distance. So 17 map units in this case. Um, and so you can look at the, 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 the cross here in more detail. But it follows the exact same strategy as the original cross from Morgan. But of course, Morgan didn't use a homozygous individual. Morgan exploited the fact that his two phenotypes were located on the X chromosome. So two-point cross allows you to do two things determine if a gene is on, or if two genes are on the same chromosome or if they're on different chromosomes. So, and when we talk about genes in point crosses, we actually mean phenotypes, right? Because we are only talking here about Mendelian phenotypes. So, so the phenotypic effect, there has to be an observable difference between individuals having AA versus individuals who are small a, small a. And this difference needs to be clear, right? If there's no real difference in, in the, the phenotype, so to speak, then we cannot do this. Um, so here, actually, we see a, a three-point cross, right? So it's the same structure again. So we have one individual. So here, we're not just having two, but we're having three. So it's the same thing again. Right, so we're, we're just crossing them, then the, you cross the offspring together, you generate the F2 population, you see how many there are which have phenotypic differences observable as the father or the mother. But in this case, of course, we cannot see the difference. Um, so hey, it's just a, a little example. But hey, so we are talking about phenotypes. These phenotypes need to be Mendelian and the difference needs to be observable. So 
either qualitative or quantitative, we need to be able to measure this distance. And that is very important when you start doing this mapping using phenotypes. So I just showed you guys this. Um, so just to show it a little bit bigger. So here again, we have um, three. Uh, so we have uh, three different genes that we're looking at um, or two in this, no, two in this case. Um, but in the end, you just determine how many parental phenotypes you have. You determine how many recombinant phenotypes you have. And then you just calculate the number of recombinants divided by the total amount of offspring that you generated. And then based on this, you can say how far apart two genes are. So we'll just look at the PowerPoint later on and uh, try to figure it out. You can also make the crossing scheme, of course. So besides the two point cross, what we also use a lot is a three-point cross. So in a three-point cross, we have three genes instead of two. So this can also be used to determine if these three genes of interest are linked or if they are independent, right? If, if all three of them are on different chromosomes or if, if two of them are on one chromosome and the other is on another chromosome. But if all three of these Mendelian phenotypes that we use for mapping, right? If they are all three on the same chromosome, then we get the distances, right? So we can calculate the distance from A to B, we can calculate the distance from B to C, and we can calculate the distance from A to C. And by knowing these three distance measurements, we can also infer the order of these genes on the chromosome. So if it's A, B in the middle, C at the end, if it's B at the beginning, A in the middle, C at the end, or if it is A at the beginning, C in the middle, and B at the end, right? So we can also make an ordering. So we can start building up a, a, a map, a genetic map. So using a three-point cross, you can determine not just the distances, but because you know three distances, you can also infer the order. Right, so in a, a three-point cross, so typically geneticists design experiments to gather data on several traits in one test cross. An example of a three-point cross would be where we have an individual, which is wild type P, wild type R, wild type J, recombinant P, recombinant R, or, uh, not wild type, but like another allele of P, another allele of R and another allele of J. And we cross this with an individual, which is homozygous, recombinant more or less which has different uh, which has the different alleles right so it's 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 just the wild type allele versus the or the, the wild type allele versus the mutant alleles and then this individual is homozygous for the mutant alleles right so in the progeny each gene has two possible phenotypes and for three genes there are two to the power of three is eight different expected phenotypic classes in the progeny if they are not too heavily linked, right? If two genes are 100% linked, then of course there's only four, but yeah, so the two to the power of three. So how does this look? So this is a three point cross, right? So here we have the genes that we're talking about. So here, and I, th I like this representation a lot because it's I, th I think it's very clear. So we can see here based on the, so we have two chromosomes from the first parent and we have the second parent. And we can see here that we have the wild type allele. We have the mutant allele using different colors. And here we see the same thing again, but this individual is homozygous for the two mutant alleles. So here the phenotypes that we're looking at are phenotypes which were studied by uh, Gregor Mendel. So you are yellow, you have an elongated fruit, or you and you are dry, right? So you're not juicy. And here parent two is purple, round, and juicy, right? So um, here, of course, the yellow phenotype is dominant over the purple phenotype. The elongated phenotype, so being long, is dominant over the round phenotype, and the dry phenotype is also dominant over the juicy phenotype, right? And we, we know this because if that would not be the case, right, if it would be an additive effect, then this individual would not be yellow, but it would be a mix between yellow and purple. It would not be elongated, but it would be a mix between the two. So three-point crosses are always done on dominant phenotypes and never on additive phenotypes because we cannot decompose the mixture, right? So, but when we do the cross, so we, we take the first cross, so we test parent one, we cross it with parent two, we get the F1 generation, 
we then cross the individuals of the F1 generation with each other and then in the end we have eight different types of, of phenotypes that can come out. Right, so this is just an example. And so here we see the, the wild type, right? So it's, it's yellow, elongated and dry. We have the mutant, which is purple, juicy and round. And then we can have the different combinations, right? And we just, have, so in this case, we made 500 offspring from the F1. And now we can just count the number of um, offspring of each of the different types that we observe. And then based on that, we can then figure out where these genes are located because here we can figure out the number of recombinants um, for the A and B phenotype, the number of recombinants for A and C, the number of recombinants for B and C and then just divide that by the total number of offspring every time. Right, so the recombination frequency is the ratio of non-parental phenotypes to the total individuals. It is expressed as a percentage which is equivalent to the number of map units between two genes and so as an example if a hundred out of a thousand individuals display the phenotypes resulting from a crossover between genes A and B then the recombination frequency is 10 percent or we can also say that genes A and B are 10 map units apart on the chromosome. And then they did this Right? So we had Drosophila and they started collecting all kinds of mutant Drosophila. So we have ones which have like uh, standard antennas versus small antennas, uh, normal wings versus miniature wings, um, big legs versus small legs, um, hey, different colors of the skin, different types of eyes, so not just so, so having red eyes and purple eyes. So all of these mutants were wild mutants from Drosophila that they caught and these were more or less, um, these were all studied. So they all did crosses between these different ones to measure the distance. And then what happens is that they determined the distance between these two, phenoty or these two phenotypic markers to be like 13 centimorgans. And then when you do a three point cross, you can determine, okay, so the, the yellow phenotype is 31 units away from the, from the red phenotype. The, per, uh, the orange one is 13 units away and this one is then um, 18 units away from that one, right? And if you know these different distances, then you can start building up a genetic map. And this is the genetic map of Drosophila that was created in 1919. So before we knew anything about DNA, before we knew anything about how inheritance is, is really working in real life. Thomas Morgan, Thomas Morgan Hunt or Thomas Hunt Morgan was already able to determine that Drosophila has four chromosomes. He was able to determine the length of each of the chromosomes and he was able to build up a genetic map to allow to associate regions of the genome with certain phenotypes. And these genetic maps were built up of purely phenotypic observations of dominant phenotype. And it is being said that the Mor Morgan's theory of the chromosome is, is a great leap of imagination which is comparable to what Galileo or Newton did. Because it took us out of the like dark ages where we knew nothing about inheritance or how inheritance worked into a world where all of a sudden we can determine how many chromosomes there are, how long the chromosomes are, which gene is located on which chromosome. And this map that they made in 1917 is still 100% accurate today. So even though we now have sequencing technology, we have all kinds of like massively expensive equipment, the work that they did by just crossing Drosophila flies together is still valid today. And we now know exactly which genes are responsible for these phenotypes that we're looking at. So we know the exact gene on the genome, but the work, so to go from having this idea like, oh, so we observe that phenotypes are inherited together, um, which is not exactly how Gregor Mendel told us. This, this is like in genetics, this is like the major step forward. 
this is where all of genetics is built on all of the last 100 years of progress which we made in our medical field um, is based on this theory because without this theory we would still be kind of struggling in the dark not understanding why some people have diseases have things like Huntington and all of these diseases they are studyable by the theory of chromosomes so today of course we have different types of maps we have high resolution maps which includes both genetic markers from test crosses so hey if you look at the genetic map from Drosophila still the uh, sepia eyes and the hairy body they are still genetic markers we still use them nowadays, but we are, have complemented this map by all kinds of DNA markers. So DNA technology where we use uh, 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 PCR or we use sequencing to determine SNPs or other things in the genome which we can dis use to distinguish individual, right? So, but yeah, genomic sequencing allows to determine of exact positions of genes and these physical maps use of course molecular tools rather than data from crossover studies. So, but so nowadays we have SNP chips where we genotype 50,000 positions in the genome. But the whole theory of genetics is way, way, way before we knew anything about how, how DNA worked. And I still think that that's amazing. Like I, I love telling this story and I love kind of getting people excited about the fact that you can know stuff and know how stuff works without even knowing what the carrier is. And without knowing that DNA existed, you could already predict in 1920 how certain fruit flies would look based on just crossing them together. And you could build up a whole genetic map to allow to associate regions of the genome which they didn't know was encoded into DNA, but associate regions with the genome with other phenotypes. All right, so that's all I wanted to say about Mendelian phenotypes. So Mendelian phenotypes are markers. Um, you, can, you can build up a chromosomal map using dominant Mendelian phenotypes, um, and it's, it's just amazing what you can do with them. So if we talk about complex phenotypes, have we have uh, differences in many genes that cause the difference in the phenotype that is observed between individuals. Um, some example of complex phenotypes, almost all phenotypes that we know of are complex, uh, except for the ones that are Mendelian. Um, but things which we know are very, very complex in a way is human stature. Like there's literally hundreds of genes which are involved in how big you are. Um, Obesity, right? How fat you are or how you respond to certain foods and that is not controlled by a single gene, but by many, many different genes. Um, the flowering times in plants is actually a complex phenotype. Um, a lot of people used to think that flowering time was more or less Mendelian um, because of experiments done with Arabidopsis and their the false understanding came from the FTO locus. So there's one locus in the I think chromosome 5 of Arabidopsis and that is a major modifier of flowering time. So if you have the, the working allele you flower probably like 20 days earlier than when you when you have the broken allele. But flowering time itself is not just controlled by this one FTO locus, no there's many different modifiers. Um, so also there there's probably like 50 to 100 genes involved to control when a flower or when a, when a plant starts to flower uh, and after being planted. Um, another very common example that's being used is milk yield. So milk yield in cows, again, there's, as far as we know now, there's one very major modifier, um, which kind of gives you plus 20% milk if you have the right allele. And if you have the wrong allele, it's like minus 20% milk. Um, but of course there's literally probably hundreds of genes in the genome which control how much milk a cow gives. So when we talk about complex phenotypes we are always interested in finding out the genetic architecture of this phenotype. Which genes are involved? How much do they contribute to the phenotype? Do they make you bigger? Do they make you smaller? How much do they make you bigger and smaller? And nowadays we use QTL mapping to study inbred populations to study these complex traits. So we have a genetic map, we have our phenotype and then we try to find out where in the genome are the locations or where in the genome are genes that are controlling my phenotype. 
And if you do that in an inbred population, right? So in a population where you control who breeds with whom, then we call this QTL mapping. And if we use a natural population, like a human population, where humans are free to choose who to mate with, um, then uh, we call this genome-wide association. And we will get back to this. We will do QTL mapping, and I will try to teach you guys how to do genome-wide association. So to find which part of the genome is involved in regulating a certain phenotypic um, observation. And that is actually kind of the biggest part of my work. So the biggest part of my work involves doing experiments and we mostly do experiments on, uh, so we do QTL mapping when we are using our own mouse population. So we do crosses between mice, we generate populations and then we measure phenotypes and then we try to determine which part of the genome is influencing our phenotypes. And we also do genome-wide association in our group here because we are also very interested in milk yield in cows. So we have done and we have published a lot of studies um, where we literally measure like hundreds to thousands of cows um, and try to figure out where the milk yield is controlled, um, which genes are involved in the, the fat percentage or the protein percentage. So that is, that is a big part of my job as a bioinformatician. All right, so we're a little bit out of sync with where I had the breaks. Um, so before the break, I will I told you about Mendelian and complex phenotypes and about linkage and genetic maps that you can make from Mendelian phenotypes. And after the break, which we won't have a break for another 15 minutes, so we'll just continue, but I will talk to you about like databases with phenotypic information and about how we do statistical analysis of phenotypes. Good. Any questions so far, by the way? Because that's, this is a slide where I normally just wait for you guys and like, do you have any questions about a two-point cross, a three-point cross, about phenotypes in general, about Mendelian phenotypes, about complex phenotypes? Then we can take like a, a little bit of time to just discuss it, talk about it. So if you have a question or an observation or just a uh, I didn't understand anything from two-point crosses, and I do want to know how a two-point cross works more in detail, um, then we can do that. Although the assignments for today will also involve you doing a, well, not doing a two-point cross, right, but like looking into the data of a two-point cross um, to kind of figure out if you can calculate the distance between two genes um, based on observations. Um, Good. No questions? That either means that everyone's asleep or it means that everyone is already like tuned out or everyone understood and I did a good job explaining it. But I, I never assume it's the third one. I always assume that either everyone tuned out already or um, no one's listening anymore and I'm just talking to myself. Which is fine. I, I do that sometimes as well. All right, no questions, we just continue. Um, all right, so about databases, um, you're doing a good job. Yeah, well, thanks, moderator. Um, uh, hey, you got a, a different icon. What, what happened? <gasps> oh my God, you subscribed with your Prime account. That's so nice that you got Prime. <laughs> Um, anyway, so what is a database? So a database is an organized collection of data, which is logical. It is the collection of schemas, tables, queries, reports, views, and other objects. So physically, of course, a database server is a dedicated computer that holds the actual database and is just running database software and all of kind, all of this related software, right? So a database itself is defined as schemas. So schemas determine what is stored in which column and what kind of type you store in there. So this is a column which holds dates and this is a column where you have usernames and this is a column where there's passwords in there. Then you have tables. So tables are like Excel tables um, with the columns according to the schema. A query is something which you can ask a database and then you have reports. That's the answer that the database gives you. And then a view is more or less a a subset of one of the tables. So that is what you are presenting to the user. 
So the phenotypic databases that I actually wanted to talk to you about is uh, a couple of them which I think are very important and like I told you at the beginning it is a little bit focused on mice because I do experiments uh, with mouse um, and of course we, we also do experiments with, with cows and other animals um, but for me I just want to talk to you guys about my work. So IMPC is the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium. Um, so the, the, the link is here. Um, so if you get the PDF from Moodle, you can just click on them. Um, I wanted to show you the OMIM database, which is the online Mendelian inheritance in men. So that is for humans, which Mendelian phenotypes are there, where are they located, and what are the effects of them. Um, the gen to fen database, which is the genotype to phenotype database, it is the database which contains a lot of QTL information. And I also wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about Gene Network, which is a database which contains a lot of data over the last 25 years. Um, it's phenotype data on mouse, but they also have phenotype data on other species. So it's not just mouse, they also have barley and um, a couple of other species in there. But it's originally a mouse database for the mouse community. Um, so there's a lot of data based on different mouse inbred strains and crosses between these inbred strains. All right, so IMPC, um, this is how the website looks like. Um, we will go to the website as well. So actually let me uh, open up a Firefox window for you guys so that we can go to uh, IMPC. Um, ba -da -ba -da but I have another slide. So IMPC is a very interesting database because they produce germline transmissions of targeted knockout mutation in embryonic strand cells for 20,000 known and predicted gene in mice. So essentially what they do is they started at the first gene on chromosome one, made a knockout mouse, and then, so, and, and then made children of those knockout mice and then see if anything happens to the phenotype of the mouse. Then they moved on to the second gene on chromosome 1, knocked it out, saw if there's any phenotypic, distance, uh, phenotypic difference, right? So they, they, their goal is to knock out every gene that is known or predicted to exist in mouse, to kind of get an idea what every gene does in the, in, in the mouse genome. Right? And of course, if a mouse gene is knocked out and the mouse gets a certain disease, then of course the homologous gene in human is probably also causing that disease in human. So it's a, it's a big fishing expedition and have one by one they are knocking out genes and they are trying to get kind of the idea or they, get a, they try to get an annotation for every gene in the genome. So how did they do this? Well, they test each of these mutant mouse lines through a broad-based phenotyping pipeline. Um, and so they look at all major adult organ systems and most areas of major human diseases. So these mice are more or less auto-phenotyped through a massive system of, of phenotyping. And the nice thing is they provide a, a centralized data center. So they have a big database and all of this data is available for free which is just amazing to think about hey, that the amount of money to just make a single knockout mice, um, well, it's not that expensive anymore with CRISPR-Cas, um, but like 10 years ago when we didn't have CRISPR-Cas and we had to do germline transmissions, right? So we used e, uh, um, EM, ENU mutants, um, it was really expensive. So getting a knockout mouse would be like 10 to $15,000 um, now, nowadays you can get a knockout mouse for like $2,000, hey, but if you multiply that by 20,000 genes, then we're talking about a database with information which is worth at least 20 million to 40 million euros. And that is, that is insane that they are just offering this for free. So let's take a look at the website. Let me push a button and then you should be able to uh, see the website. Um, so as you can see here, um, they have 7,824 genes knocked out today, right? If you would have looked like three years ago, it would say like 4,000 and it's going faster and faster because of new technologies, because of CRISPR-Cosp, um, it's easier and easier to create knockout mice. Um, so, and each of these mice have been phenotyped. All right, so question to you guys, what's your favorite gene? 
or your favorite phenotype because they allow two ways of searching so you can search by genes or you can search by phenotype um, so is there anything that you guys are interested in is there any gene that you are currently studying or that you think oh that's an interesting gene um, just give me an example I can fill in my favorite gene um, but that's a very boring gene I don't even think that they have a knockout mouse for that because when you knock out the gene it turns out that mice are don't get born so but that's my favorite gene but I, I want to get just one of you guys so we can throw it in and if you have a favorite phenotype in mouse right I really want to know what is controlling tail length in the mouse or I want to see eye color in the mouse then you can just search for the phenotypes so just so that you guys get an idea and we can just I can talk you guys through the different screens that they have. Feeling that everyone's sleeping again. But, uh, it's a little bit of a shame. Come on, people, give me a gene. What is your favorite gene? As a biologist, you should have a favorite gene. Everyone should have a favorite gene. waiting waiting go for obese all right we go for obese so obese is of course not a not a gene but a phenotype um, so we can just say well obesity right so um, when you search for obesity it says well we don't know exactly what obesity is because obesity is in this case defined as abnormal body weight right so the body weight could be lower it could be um, higher and of course uh, it knows that obesity is also related to things like body size um, <laughs> I wasn't sleeping, but never thinking about my favorite gene. Yeah, well, you can, you can just pick one, right? There's 20,000, so the chances of two people picking the same favorite gene are relatively small. Um, so there's, there's, and like you can see that that they use ontologies. Like we talked about gene ontology, there is also here phenotype ontology. So obesity as itself is not a official structure ontology right a, 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 a vocabulary which is uh, fixed so that you can always talk about the same thing um, so but hey if we look at abnormal body weight it says that there's 144 genes associated with this phenotype meaning that from the 7,000 something knockouts that they made 144 of these um, showed a difference in the body weight um, so in total, they actually tested 8,185 apparently. Um, so, hey, and then you can see here, okay. So for example, the ACT2 gene, when it is homozygous in males and in females, when they are early adults, it when you knock it out, you decrease the body weight. So, and this has a very, very significant p-value of zero, which means that it's like, definitely for sure that this gene is controlling the body weight right so and if we want to know more about this gene we can just click about click on it right then you go to the um, act2 data chart yeah right so here we go of course because we searched in relationship to body weight and body weight we already go to the body weight table so what do we see here we see that body weight was performed on 445 mice uh, the chart showed the result of uh, body weights in 25 females and 17 male mutants compared to 177 female and 200 controls right so just to give you an idea of the amount of data that is in there and literally thousands and thousands of mice are more or less studied for this project to give us an idea Right, so what do we see here? We see that there's a testing protocol that they used, a uh, certain testing environment, right? So that's all standardized between different laboratories. Um, the background strain, um, so there are different types of inbred mice, so they use a certain strain and then compare the knockout to the standard strain. Um, and of course it says decreased body weight, which you already knew. So what you see here is different, um, different uh, uh, graphs right so we see here that a wild type female is on average um, 21.7 grams a female where you knocked out this act2 gene actually is on average uh, not on average but on median has a 17 gram body weight right so we can directly know that okay so if you knock out act2 you will lose 
um, 21, so to say, you will lose around 4.7 grams of body weight when you are a female. When you are a male, um, the effect is a little bit bigger, right? Um, and you can actually see all of the body parameter plots, right? And here you can see the, the measurements that they did from September 2007, uh, where they measured the triangles. So the triangles here are the wild type females, and you have wild type, or the triangles are the wild type males, the circles are the wild type females. So a lot of wild types were measured. Then they measured even more wild types, and then they started measuring the homozygous knockouts. And hit. so here you can see when the measurements were done. Right? It shows you a summary table, it shows you that there's a, a massive, massive influence of this gene on the phenotype and they also show you which statistics they used and you can actually get access to all of the data. So you can just download all of the body weight data done on the males and on the females. And this is a, this is a, a massive, massive resource. So if you want to know anything about your phenotype of interest and of course this this database since it is mouse if you're interested in flowering time of course you you're not going to it's not going to work right because mice don't flower or not really um, but hey, any phenotype that you might be interested in humans they will have some genes so if you ever have to write a master thesis and your master thesis is about obesity then this database can help you give you a list of genes which might be involved in obesity um, and not just that but it it generally also um, provides the data to you so you can redo the analysis yourself or you could look at, at other things right so if we just go back to the act 2 gene right so not just the body weight and then we see here the summary of the gene and of course the gene does not only control body weight right it has an, a significant influence so here with the little um, phenotype summary using the nice um, pictograms. Hey, you can see which ones are significantly affected, which were not significantly affected, and which were not tested yet. So hey, if we just hover over it, we can see that the skeleton, if you knock out ACT2, is significantly affected. But for example, the limbs, so the digits or the tail, it doesn't have a significant influence on that. It's a perfect database to get a little bit of an overview of what's going on with my phenotype or what's going on with my favorite gene, right? So my favorite gene or not so much favorite gene because like is actually BBS7. Um, so we can actually search for BBS7. So BB, BBS7 is one of the genes that we study a lot because one of our mouse models has um, very likely a kind of mutation in BBS7. Um, we work on uh, a mouse model which is called the Berlin Fat Mouse, um, and the Berlin Fat Mouse, like the the the, the name already says, is, is is fat. It's really fat compared to a normal mouse. Um, I will probably show you guys a couple of uh, pictures about that as well uh, in later presentations. Um, but BBS7 is the gene that when we did QTL mapping, so we did show the fat mouse. Yeah, and then I have to look at a picture of the fat mouse. Let me get you guys a picture. Um, since it's three, I will actually stop the recording. So um, for the people watching it on Moodle, I will see you in part three of the lecture. And you're not going to see the Berlin fat mouse. So you will have to wait until the next lecture. So I'm going to stop the recording.